Our guest this evening is our own senior senator, Paul S. Sarbanes. He was elected to the Senate in 1976 after having served three terms in the United States House of Representatives. Earlier than that, he had served in the Maryland House of Delegates from 1966 until 1970, so that much of his adult life has been spent in elective politics. <coughs> Senator Sarbanes attended the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton University, from which he graduated magna cum laude and Phi Beta Kappa. Subsequently, he went to Balliol College at Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar, and then on to the Harvard Law School, from which he graduated with honors in 1960. After clerking for Judge Morris A. Soper, he joined the Baltimore firm of Piper and Marbury in 1961. Later, he served as an associate in the firm of Venable Bater and Howard before beginning his political career. As a member of the United States Senate, he serves as chairman of the International Business and Economic Subcommittee and as a member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Well, I think it's fair to say that Marylanders of all political stripes are immensely proud of the quiet, dignified way in which our senior senator carries out his duties while standing at the same time as a model of senatorial rectitude among his peers. And many of us have felt let down, I guess I should say, by the activities of some of our other elected officials. But Paul Sarbanes has engendered nothing but respect from both sides of the aisle. Equally, it's always a pleasure to see one's elected, elected representatives on the streets of Maryland cities and towns. And we certainly do see Senator and Mrs. Sarbanes, whom we're equally delighted to welcome here tonight, all over Maryland, all the time. So it's a very great pleasure for me to introduce him to you now, the Honorable Paul S. Sarbanes. Uh, thank you very much, Sheila. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to be back with the, uh, with the council and I have an opportunity once again to trade thoughts with you. I know how, can you hear me all right in the back? Good. This is a nice audience. I once spoke to a group, this happened literally, and I said, can you hear me in the back? And some lady in the back stands up, she says, we can't hear you. And there was a, there was a lady sitting right down front where my wife Christine is, not my wife incidentally, doing this, who got up at that point and said, I'll trade places with you. <laughs> And it was clear to me at that moment it was not going to be an easy evening. So, <laughs> I know uh, we want to save a good period of time for questions and for our own discussion. Uh, Frank Bird's going to take those questions or recognize the people, and I'm very much looking forward to that. But uh, before we get to that to that part of the evening, uh, there's there's some comments I want to address on the on the question of the, the global economy and the United States role in it. Um, I think the most striking thing, and it's a truism really, is the extent to which the major items now on the economic agenda are international. Um, clearly we're part of a global economy. Uh, that in a sense represents a very significant transformation in the post-World War II period. Uh, the United States, in fact, helped to bring that about. And uh, in fact, it's been a stated uh, premise of our, of our international policy to try to, in effect, develop and expand the global economy, increase the amount of interrelationship amongst uh, nations, and through that, hopefully, bring increased prosperity, and with increased prosperity, hopefully, a more stable and peaceful world. Uh, I subscribe to the premises of that policy, which I think have governed American action for now almost uh, half a century. Uh, but there have been some developments in, in recent years that I think have, uh, in effect, put us in a, in a situation that is unique, one we've not confronted. And I want to just 
talk a bit first about where we are and then what I think we need to, to do about it. Uh, one of the things that is of deepest concern is the fact that the United States has now moved from being a creditor nation to being a debtor nation. Now, this is in large part the consequence of the unprecedented trade deficits which we have been running in, in recent years. And I've got a few charts here which I'm going to try to use, hopefully successfully. Um, I don't know whether... Can, can, can you make anything out in the back of the room? Can you see that? Well, what this shows is the American trade balance. And the, the blue line, the lower line, is the balance on merchandise trade only. The red line is the balance on goods and services. And of course, this is 1932 back here, and we run out to 1987, which is the last full year for which we have figures. And what it shows, of course, is an extraordinary deterioration in the U.S. trade balance beginning in the late uh, 1970s and then accelerating very rapidly in the, in the 1980s. And of course, uh, you know, this is the trade deficit about which we talk about. It's unprecedented. Uh, the precipitous decline in our merchandise trade account in the early 1980s, which is the blue line, that's where it began first, uh, reflected a number of factors, not the least of which was the grossly overvalued dollar. Uh, and this, of course, took um, a major toll on our merchandise trade. In other words, we had difficulty exporting, and we took in a flood of imports. And therefore, we ran a, a very significant a negative trade position. Uh, what that did, of course, over time, it used to be that the uh, services would balance that off. We always had a little better balance there, but that has also deteriorated now. And so the consequence of this, and it's happened very quickly, is the United States now is a debtor nation. And uh, you can see that in this chart. This is the net asset position of the United States. This is 1971 here, 1987 on the far side. Well, obviously, if your trade deficit is going to run negative, as the previous chart showed over a number of successive years, your asset position is going to deteriorate. And of course, that's what happened. Now, this position was positive beginning in World War I. In other words, if I, if I had extended this chart all the way back to 1919, the United States would have shown a positive net asset position. Um, so that represents a very sharp change from what was previously the situation, which has prevailed, which prevailed for, um, you know, 60 years, a little more than 60 years. Now, the implications of this, I think, are, are, are very serious. Uh, we obviously, in my judgment, can't continue to go uh, deeper into debt and retain our status as a world leader. In fact, I submit there's a basic contradiction between those two things. Uh, Fred Bergston, who's a very able economist, wrote in Foreign Affairs in the spring of 1987, and I quote him, can the world's largest debtor nation remain the world's leading power? Can the United States continue to lead its alliance system as it goes increasingly into debt to the countries that are supposed to be its followers? Can it push those countries hard in pursuit of its economic imperatives while insisting on their allegiance on issues of global strategy? Well, I think those are all obviously critical questions, and I, and I share really the point of view that reflects those, those questions. Or as Walter Heller, for whom I worked when he was chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors in the Kennedy administration, uh, said before he, his death, commenting about this development, that it's very hard to ride in the town and stand tall in the saddle if you find yourself in debt to everyone you see on the street corner as you, as you pass through town. Now let's look a bit at why this uh, 
happen uh, or what can be done about it. Because as serious as it is, I have a basically optimistic point of view if, in fact, we can marshal the will uh, to do a number of things that, uh, that need to be done. Uh, first of all, and we're in the process of doing some of those things. Uh, these, some of these trends are improving. The trouble is we don't have a lot of time, and until you turn them completely around, the situation worsens. In other words, as long as you, as long as you run a trade imbalance, a deficit, this debt position will worsen. So, like when they say, well, you know, we've cut the trade imbalance from 160 billion to 130 billion last year to the next year, which is a pretty impressive performance. I mean, that's a, that, an improvement of 30 billion in, in a year's time in your trade position is, is, uh, is no small thing. The fact is, though, is you're still going to add 130 billion to, to this figure. And the following year, if you cut it to 100, you're still going to add 100. So this continues to grow, and there's some estimates that we may, in fact, be in a trillion dollar negative position before we finally uh, balance this thing out. Then you have the whole problem of trying uh, to come back from that situation. Now, Obviously, we need to develop a fundamental reorientation of policy. It's going to take some hard choices and some new directions. Uh, basically, as a nation, I think we have to place a higher priority on production than consumption. This imbalance is almost going to force us to do that, because what we're going to have to do in the future, given the claims that foreigners now hold on us, is we're going to have to produce more than we consume in order to have a, a margin in there with which to pay, uh, to pay the claims. Um, and we need really to promote investment for the future rather than indulgence uh, for the present. Now, there are a range of policies, and I want to talk about those. I want to talk first about what we need to do in our domestic policy, uh, secondly, what we need to do in foreign economic policy. And then thirdly, I want to talk about the framework in which we find ourselves. And this is probably going to be the central thrust of what I want to put to you tonight. And this really is the issue of burden sharing, about which there's been increasing discussion in this country. And that really goes to the question of getting the framework, the international framework in which we are operating, into proper balance. In other words, if you're trying to play on a tilted field, it's slanted against you. Uh, it's true you may do lots of things that need to be done, both domestic and, in, and internationally, but if you don't get the framework into proper balance, you're always, in effect, operating at a handicap. And it's my thesis tonight that developments over the the f almost 50 years since the end of World War II are such that there needs to be a fundamental reorientation of the allocation of responsibilities that reflects uh, the changes that have taken place in the strength of economies uh, throughout the world. Uh, first of all, on domestic economic policy. Well, obviously, and I need not stress this, it's been stressed, we need an appropriate fiscal and monetary policy, and we, of course, need to, to do something about the, uh, the federal deficit, for which I have another chart that I want to show you. Not happily, I might say. This is the, um, that's the federal budget deficit. Now, this is not in constant dollars. So to that extent, it, it uh, magnifies the impact of the, this is in just in, in um, nominal dollars. But nevertheless, you can see this very fast run up in the deficit, some in the 1970s and then very marked in the, in the 1980s. Now, uh, people say, why did that happen? It happened essentially for two reasons. Uh, one was the erosion of the revenue base, and I don't have a chart to show that, but essentially we got a period there where the revenue base moved relatively on a flat level at the same time that spending 
was continuing to rise despite this struggle between the, uh, the Congress and President Reagan over spending. And the reason spending rose is reflected in this chart. The blue line is military spending, and the orange line is civilian spending. And it runs from 1971 to 1987. So in effect, what you had is in uh, beginning in 1980 is you had a takeoff in military spending at a time when civilian spending was not being held quite constant, but roughly constant, and this sort of steady trend upwards was, was arrested, as you can see. But we had a sharp increase in the military spending. So you had an increase in spending. You had your revenue base, in effect, uh, tapering off, and of course the consequence of that is a, is a, uh, is a growth in your deficit. Um, now in my view, uh, a proper and effective federal budget policy would be addressed not only to deficit reduction, which is very important, uh, but also would seek proper budget priorities. A reduction in a budget deficit alone will not in itself restore balance to our external accounts. If we're really trying to address the trade deficit in our position internationally, I think we also have to recognize at the same time that there's some elements of our, our budget which constitute important investments in our future economic strength. Uh, so you have to, in effect, have a budget policy that is get, gets the deficit down and at the same time, at least in my view, makes the proper choices and has sufficient resources to make investments in such things as the education and training of our workforce. I mean, we're in a very competitive international environment. Other countries are making very significant investments in their workforce. And I think it's just foolishness to expect we're going to be able to compete effectively if we don't, in effect, bring our own workforce to, to high standards. Uh, secondly, in physical infrastructure, which I think is ne necessary for the efficient production and movement of goods, dredging the Port of Baltimore is an, is an example of that, maintaining a first-class transportation network uh, for, the movement of, for the movement of goods. And uh, so you have a whole range of highways, bridges, rail, ports, water and sewer systems, which are deteriorating, of course, in many of our older cities. And thirdly is maintaining our civilian technology base, uh, research and development. Now, I think, frankly, it's fair to say that in a world of rapid technological change, a failure to invest in your civilian technology base uh, probably means ceding control of your future to, our comp to your competitors. And of course, we've had difficulty in that regard. And this is just a comparison of, uh, this is non-defense research and development as a percent of GMP, not defense. If you included defense, you'd get a chart that showed us roughly comparable. But if you take non-defense R&D and what's happened in recent periods, is the split in this country has gone from about 50-50 in terms of the use of the federal dollar, civilian and military are indeed, to 70-30, 70 military, 30 civilian. This is a comparison between West Germany and Japan and the United States. In 1971, we were, well, we were still below, but we were approximately about the same, 1.7 to about 2 percent of of GMP and non-defense R&D. You can see what's happened uh, over the last, uh, well, 16, 17 years. Japan and West Germany have increased the percent of their GMP and non-defense R&D. The United States has uh, remained uh, relatively constant. Now let me turn to the, to the foreign economic uh, policy side very quickly. Um, First of all, I talked earlier about the exchange rates, which are exceedingly important. Donald Reagan, when he was Secretary of the Treasury, um, it, 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 it really defies understanding why he took the position that he did. And most European uh, 
finance and economic ministry people and even bankers in the private sector I've talked to it don't understand why the U.S. followed that policy of, of simply uh, leaving the currency a alone. So we had an overvalued American dollar. Now that's very nice if you're a tourist because it means if you're going abroad your dollar will, will buy a lot and people are very happy about that. But on the producing side of the agenda, it's very tough. In fact, American producers were estimated to be at about a 30 to 40 percent price handicap because of the currency overvaluation. So they found it extremely expensive to sell their goods abroad, and they were facing competition from goods coming into this country that were extremely inexpensive because of the benefit they got uh, from the exchange rate. Uh, Jim Baker, to his credit, when he went over to Treasury, immediately moved to change that situation, and that's when you got the Plaza Accords and the effort then to affect the uh, the value of the dollar. So it was a you know we we exchanged Baker for Donald Reagan. Reagan, as you recall, went to the White House to be Chief of Staff, and Baker came to the Treasury. That was a pretty good deal for the Treasury. It didn't turn out so well for the White House in terms of <laughs> of developments. We have put in the trade bill, which we passed last year, a provision now to require uh, reports on the exchange rate situation from the Treasury twice a year to the Congress. That's an effort really to put some focus on this issue, uh, to in effect require the Treasury to address it, to have to come to the Congress and the American people and the press, and in effect state where, where they are, and with particular emphasis on those countries that may be manipulating their currency against the American dollar, which has in fact been occurring. The Treasury, when it made its first report back in the fall, pinpointed Taiwan and South Korea as two countries that had been manipulating their currency against the American dollar in order to gain a trade advantage. Um, Taiwan was not cited this time. There have been some very interesting movements in, in the valuation of, the, of, the, of their currency. Interestingly enough, a lot of those come just about the time these reports are due to the Congress. Uh, so we think the reports may, in fact, be serving a very uh, useful purpose, and it gives the Treasury a, something to use in their, in their, uh, in their negotiating. Uh, secondly, is the question of reducing foreign trade barriers. Uh, there are provisions in the trade bill last year that tried to deal with that. There's some discussion in this country about whether they constitute protectionism. I do not think they do, and they certainly not intended to. It's interesting, even the Super 301 provision is a, an acceptance of the proposition of an open, expanding international trade. But the premise of it is, if others are to have access into our markets, we ought to have access into their markets, that the rules have to work both ways. There has to be an element of uh, reciprocity, and that nations that uh, put barriers uh, can't expect to do that on the one hand, and at the same time, assume that they're going to have a free and easy and open access into the, into the American market. Otherwise, it simply will not work. And the competitive situation has gotten such that we're no longer the, the dominant economic power, which we were uh, at, the end of, um, at the end of World War II. In 1950, just to give you a comparison, the gross domestic product of the United States was two and a half times the combined size of the NATO countries and 26 times as great as Japan. That's in 1950. Just to show you, in effect, the economic hegemony that the United States had at that time. In 1987, we've gone from two and a half times the combined size of the NATO countries to just slightly larger than the economies of the NATO countries, and from 26 times as great as Japan to being only twice as great as Japan. So you can see that shift in, in relative economic strengths. Now, I frankly welcome it. I mean, the whole purpose of our policy after World War II, the Marshall Plan and all the other programs that followed, was to help rebuild the economies of these nations. 
uh, on the premise that that would lead to a more prosperous and, and peaceful world. Now, we also need to uh, look to these countries now to assume uh, some broader responsibilities. And I want to mention um, two or three ways in which that can be done. First of all, let me put it in some perspective. We have a handout that you can get later in the back of the room, which is an excerpt from one of the reports of the Joint Economic Committee addressed to the question of, of burden sharing. The burden sharing is usually talked about in terms of the discrepancy in the defense or security burden between what the United States spends and what is spent by our allies. The United States spends about a little over 6.5% of its GMP on defense. Uh, the NATO countries, the European countries, spend about 3.5% of their GMP on defense. And Japan spends about 1% of GMP on defense. So you've got you know, very significant differences in the level, percentage level of expenditure on defense. So we're carrying this defense and security burden uh, helping to provide the security umbrella for the Western alliance at the same time that we're engaged under that umbrella in a very intense economic competition. Now obviously if other countries get the benefit of the security umbrella without having to make a comparable investment in providing it, that leaves them with resources that they can channel into the economic competition. If we were spending only 1% of GMP on defense, as Japan is, think of what we could do with all the rest of those resources. I mean, we wouldn't have a deficit. We'd be able to put more funds into education and training and research and so forth and uh, so forth and so on. Now, there's a tendency to try to remedy this discrepancy solely within the military or the security dimension. So people then focus on uh, rearming Japan, uh, pushing the European countries to make a larger contribution. Of course, they respond they're making a large contribution now and that they bear a lot of the psychic cost of the defense because of the location of forces on their territory. This is, argument is made very strongly by the Germans, and it's not without merit, in my opinion. I mean, if we had in this country a comparable situation in terms of the presence of forces and maneuvers and the occasional um, tragic accident that occurs and so forth, I think we'd have a very strong public reaction. They also point out that they get their military force through conscription, therefore pay them much less so that the comparison on dollar contributions are not altogether apples, I mean, you're comparing to some extent apples and oranges. But nevertheless, it's still clear that we're making by far the largest investment, and certainly when you compare us with Japan. Now, I'm not for pushing the Japanese to rearm. I mean, the political consequences of that are very serious, provokes very strong reaction from many of our Pacific Rim allies for obvious reasons. And I don't know why one would want their grandchild many years later to say, you know, why did you push Japan to be a militaristic nation once again? First of all, it's the U.S. economy that has essentially been the engine of growth in the international environment. I think it's reasonable to look to West Germany and Japan and some of the other strong economies to pick up some of that responsibility and some of that burden so that they would have a more expansive a domestic economic policy, therefore become more of a, of a market for receiving goods abroad. In the five years between 1981 and 1986, the United States took 50% of the manufacturing exports of developing countries. In other words, the manufacturing exports of developing countries, 50% of them were taken by the United States. Europe took 14%, and Japan took 4%. Now, it seems to me reasonable, given the strength of their economies, that they should now begin to assume some of these uh, responsibilities. Uh, secondly, I think there's a major role to be played in addressing the third world debt crisis. 
Secretary Brady's come forward with the Brady Plan, which I very strongly support, uh, but it's going to need help from those countries running large surpluses, current account surpluses. Again, Japan, West Germany, some of the Pacific Rim countries, and I think they now move, need to circulate some of those capital surpluses into the third world countries in order to help them grow, just as the United States did at the time when it was a very large surplus country. I remember at the time I worked for Walter Heller at the Council of Economic Bi Advisors, it was a, the U.S. was very careful to try to hold down our surpluses because the reverse of surpluses in one country are deficits somewhere else, and there was an understanding that you couldn't have these large imbalances develop without placing the international financial system in, in some jeopardy. Uh, with Europe moving towards Europe 92 and a united Europe, a, a, a watershed development, uh, something that I'm hopeful will be very positive. It's been a part of our policy for a long time, and I think uh, properly handled will be positive. I think we can look to the Europeans to play more of a role as a united entity. I look to Japan and the Pacific Rim countries again to assume some of these economic responsibilities. So you get more of an evening of responsibility when you take into account both the military and the economic uh, responsibilities. Now that is the framework which I think has to be put in balance. Within that framework, the United States has to do a great many things to improve its competitive ability. We have to straighten out our budget situation. We have to understand we're in a competitive world, which means we have to pay attention to Producti productivity, quality of product. That means the education and training of our people. It means research and development. It means building an, an economic infrastructure that is ready for the challenges of the, of the 21st century. Now there's one additional development that I want to mention, and then I'll conclude and turn to questions, and that is the possible impact on all of this by the emergence of General Secretary Gorbachev in the Soviet Union and what that might portend in terms of the military burden that will be carried by the West. The possibilities are very large indeed, but we don't know yet whether in fact they'll be realized. And so I think in the short run, uh, the notion that we're going to reap large benefits in that area is, is really not in the cards. But I do think that we need to be pressing in every way that we can to explore the possibilities of reaching understandings which would not have been thought of or were unheard of only a few years ago. It's very clear that Gorbachev and Soviet society are under immense economic pressures. Uh, they need to address them. Uh, they've come forward in the arms area with some extremely interesting proposals. And I think the West needs to press them in every regard. And I am pleased that the various arms talks now are, are getting underway. I've just been appointed to the uh, Senate Arms Control Observer Group for the Geneva and Vienna talks. And we'll be going with a delegation there at the end of uh, at the end of June. But this is obviously a matter which has enormous potential significance for the nature of international relations. We have to proceed in a very prudent, thorough way to explore it, to try to realize it. We have to be certain at each step that, in fact, what we have is, is real and firm and verifiable and so forth. So potentially, it could alter all of the burdens that I'm talking about in a very significant way. But it is not there now. I don't expect it to be there in the immediate future. Uh, but in a sense, it, it may well transcend all of this framework that I've been outlining to you. The, uh, the question is, would you comment upon wage scales around the world and how that impacts upon US wage scales and the variety of problems which you've identified? Well, the, the wage scales now in the other major industrial countries are comparable, it, particularly if you factor in um, everything that's uh, involved. And um, 
again, we've always managed to sustain a higher wage scale through productivity and through the use of capital investment. So we put labor and capital together in such a way that we're able to sustain our workers at a higher level and still be able to compete. We continue to face that challenge. It's not a new challenge. I think it's been toughened up because technology moves more quickly nowadays. So we don't have the same lead advantage off of technology or it doesn't last as long. But I think, uh, I mean, American manufacturers, with the, with, when the dollar was brought back to reasonable levels, and if you eliminate some of these uh, trade barriers and so forth, I'm, I'm fairly confident that we can compete. Uh, it's not easy, it'll be fairly tough, but I think we can do it without sort of trying to depress uh, the standard of living. But that's the challenge, there's no question about it. Well, I, they have a constitutional, as I understand it, they can go above it, but it's an article of faith in their country that they shouldn't, and I don't think they should be pressed to do it for the reasons I outlined, uh, including, and one I didn't mention, I mentioned the reaction of other countries and its political uh, repercussions but it also provokes a very intense divisions within Japanese society. And you may find the United States, in effect, encouraging elements within Japanese society that you don't want to encourage in terms of the future direction in, in, uh, in which the world is going to go. I'm, I'm happy to, for them to stay there if they then use the large surpluses they're accumulating to pick up some of these other economic responsibilities that I talked about and to pick them up in a multilateral, not a bilateral context. Now, the Japanese have offered to do something on third world debt. I don't think it's enough. I think it ought to be more. And I think it ought to be done multilaterally. They're going to do it through their export-import bank, which immediately creates the apprehension that is simply going to be used as a way to tie these countries into a trading relationship with Japan only, rather than help them expand, leaving the trading relationship to be developed generally internationally. But Japan could help significantly with the Latin American debt, and that would then offer an opportunity for the United States. We're running a $55 billion trade deficit with Japan as you know, by far the largest we have with any single trading partner. The senator is asked to comment upon tax increases. I don't think you're, you're, you're going to solve the deficit problem and the problem of attaining proper budget priorities without a balanced package that would encompass restraint in defense spending, domestic spending, and, and a component on the revenue side. And I think that's the way you create an approach which would enable us to, to lower the deficit. I don't, I mean, I did not support Graham Rudman. I don't think you ought to put yourself into a situation of automatic pilot. I mean, I have always thought that an essential premise of good decision making was to maintain your options, but to keep them open in, in order to, to react to circumstance. And the notion that you simply foreclose options and preclude them and sort of go on automatic pilot doesn't seem to be a sensible way to make, to make policy. But we do need to get the deficit down, particularly given where we are right now in, the, in terms of the economy. We're running at a little over 5% unemployment. Now, if the unemployment rate should start up, and no one's yet asserted that we've abolished the business cycle from, from, our, from econ uh, economic reality, each 1% increase in the unemployment rate adds another $40 billion on your deficit. So, of course, the time to get the deficit down is when your unemployment situation is pretty good, because if it worsens, it's going to go up in any event. So we're skating on very thin ice, and we need to address that situation while we have an opportunity to do so. The question is, uh, to whom besides Japan do we owe these huge amounts of money? Well, first of all, we owe it to ourselves. I mean, I, I'm not trying to absolve the United uh, Americans of our responsibility, and you know that embraces the president and the Congress and and the country, really. I mean, uh, Adlai Stevenson once said, you know, the American people get the government they deserve, and I. There may be a lot of tr truth to that. I think there's a so 
you know, we've not had the right mix of policies to address a lot of these questions. At the same time, though, I do think that we and the rest of the world have been operating off of premises that were appropriate 30 years ago, even 20 years ago, but are no longer appropriate today. And we have to develop new ways of thinking. Um, you know, we're still the, the major economic power, but we're not the only major economic power. And as other countries have moved into that position, I don't think there's been a commensurate assumption of responsibilities. And I think that's an issue that, that needs to be addressed. And I think it's one of the items the president ought to have on, on the agenda as he goes to these economic summits. It's easier, though, for him to have it on the agenda, I recognize, if we've straightened out some of these domestic economic policies that I talked about so they can't immediately come back at him and say, well, the U.S. is failing to do this, this, and this. The end result of all of this is that if you want to be a great power, you have to be prepared, I think, to commit the resources in order to be a great power. You can't be a great power on the cheap for very long. And I think the United States continues to have a leadership role in the world. I feel very strongly that the United States has exercised its leadership role in the post-World War II period in a broader, uh, in a sense, deeper way than I think any other country would have done so or that we can anticipate any other country would do now with a more of a sense that um, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. In other words, let's develop an economic environment in which all prosper rather than simply trying to score for ourselves. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, no, no. I thought, no, we owe the debt abroad. I thought you meant why did it happen? In other words, what was the cause of it? If you literally mean who do we owe it to, oh, no. That's one of the problems with this. Um, <laughs> No, but when you owe it abroad, you've got to pay it. At least you have to service it. So that's an outflow of resources from this country abroad. When you owed it internally, it had income distribution ramifications. In other words, the money was being shifted from those paying the taxes in to, to service the bonds or the notes, and that represented a shift upwards in the income scale because those were generally held by the more prosperous people but the money was still held within the country. When you owe it abroad, it goes out. I mean, you have to service that, those holdings. And so that's something that has to, in effect, come out of our standard of living to help support the standard of living of others. The, uh, the question is, instead of emphasizing uh, our responsibilities to the global economy, should we be more self-interestedly nationalistic in our policies? Well, I, I'm not quite sure what that means because the percent of the German and Japanese economy that is geared internationally is much larger than ours. I mean, uh, you know, Germany, almost half of Germany's, uh, West Germany's GMP is tied to international trade, which in ours is, up, I think, about 15, 18, uh, maybe it's up to 18 percent now. So they're, in a sense, uh, much more integrated into an international economy, although a lot of that is the European economy, where, of course, Germany is the principal and, in, a, in many sense, almost the dominant uh, actor. Um, I don't think there's a, any turning back. In other words, I think we have to move, have a commitment to an open international trading regime. Now we have to make sure that that regime is really open and reciprocal. And much of what the Congress has been doing in recent years, which is perceived by some to be protectionist in the minds of many of us, is not that. It's simply trying to get the rules to work both ways. And, uh, you know, it's what are you going to do when you're running a $55 billion trade deficit with one country only? And when you look at the situation, uh, the Joint Economic Committee did a report, actually, on restoring international balance, Japan's trade and investment patterns. And we looked very carefully into the workings of the, of the Japanese economy. And I, 
and um, you know, there are real problems there in terms of reducing those balances. It's not so much that they have these formal barriers against our exports, but there's a whole informal network of arrangements which serves to, to there are some formal barriers and we try to address those, but beyond that, there's a whole network of, in, of informal arrangements that constitute, constitute barriers. Would you comment on the role of the National Institute of Science and Technology and the Department of Commerce in uh, guiding us to uh, a greater role in uh, the area of technology? Oh, well, I, I think they both have sig very significant roles to play, and I, I do think the new um, Secretary of Commerce is fairly sensitive to some of the concerns that I've been talking about. Um, but I think as a nation, we just have to marshal a major effort to take ourselves to a new level in terms of, of this whole competitiveness and productivity. Um, uh, Senator Mikulski and I give each year a productivity award in this state, and we invite companies to come in and compete for it. It's handled by the center at the University of, uh, of Maryland, Dr. Tuttle and his colleagues. And it's very interesting to see the tremendous improvements that companies have been able and their workforce and I add that very quickly because it's invariably because they've changed the nature of labor management relationships in the in the workplace that almost in every instance for the accounts for these very significant improvements and increases in productivity and of course that needs to be simply spread across the board so we you know, with the same amount of inputs, you get more outputs. The question is for the, for the people in the rear of the room, uh, whether the events in China will have an impact upon uh, Chinese-American economic relations. Hong Kong, Hong Kong as well. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, it's bound to have an impact. I mean, it's cast the uh, questions uh, over the whole developments in China. Um, the president's already suspended uh, the military relationship, and I, I uh, anticipate that it's also going to have an, an impact in Washington on the, uh, on the economic uh, relationship. Um, I have to say to you, though, that as appealing as the, for many the economic prospects seem to be, uh, or as much as they attract the imagination of people both in the Soviet Union and China, because they see them, I guess, as these vast, undeveloped and unexplored countries in an economic sense. And maybe over the passage of time that, in fact, will happen. I think the real economic ball game in the near or midterm future lies elsewhere. I mean, you've got these Pacific Rim countries that are growing at very rapid rates, extremely productive. You've got Europe now coming together with one single market, 320 million people, a GNP almost uh, approximating uh, the United States. You continue to have the American market, the single most important market in the world. And actually, the, um, some of the question I was asked about the, uh, the, uh, the focus on America or something. There's not an inconsistency. I mean, if we sharpen our competitive abilities in order to deal internationally, which presupposes exporting, uh, we also sharpen our competitive ability to deal with imports. In other words, we become more uh, effective producers in terms of competing with imports and therefore more active players within our own market at the same time that we enhance our capacity in the, inter in the international market. The uh, observation is that we're, are we not, uh, a service-oriented economy. In order to do better in the world, do we not have to become a producing economy? And if that's true, how do we go about it? Well, of course, the, the world economy is moving in an information service direction. So to some extent, that's happening everywhere. Uh, secondly, much of what is seen as service is really production in the modern sense, and computers is the classic instance of that, I guess, because computers tend to be categorized as, as service rather than hard manufacturing. 
Uh, thirdly, if we carry out the program I'm talking about, we'll be more effective competitors in the manufacturing sector. I'm not one of those who is prepared simply to depart from the manufacturing sector. I think we need to pay attention to it and need to strengthen it. And there are indications we can do that. Some of the turnarounds in some of the manufacturing facilities in this country are extraordinarily impressive. If we didn't have them, I'd be worried more about some systemic inability to deal with this problem. But when you see those sorts of things happening, you see productivity go up, you see quality improve, you see people able to come out with a product that will compare with anyone's, then you say, well, we can do it. It's not as though for some systemic reason we can't do it, we can do it. Now the question is, why can't we broaden this performance out so it becomes typical rather than seeming to be atypical. And I think that's one of the challenges we have as a society. But that requires a major investment in terms of marshalling our, our resources. I think the question is, um, with respect to reductions in military spending, what kind of plans for conversion of those resources uh, are in the Congress at the present time? Yeah, it's a very it's a very good question, and there's no there's no real plan on the on the board at the moment. I don't think the extent of the restraint in defense spending is such at this point that it requires a major plan. But if if in fact a real breakthrough comes in comes through in the defense arena, uh, then obviously we will have to address that issue. I think there's a range of other things that need to be done. All of the, I mean, I can, you can make a list of unmet needs a mile long and uh, that could be addressed if we had the opportunity to do so. But I think if you get a, if, if the arms discussions and the relationships develop in such a way that we can achieve a, a significant, very significant reductions in the defense budget, we don't know that yet, uh, then you're going to have to link it with some sort of sensible conversion effort. But you know, the pro I mean, I didn't talk about, the one issue I didn't talk about, which has now reached um, international attention, is the environmental issue. If you want to talk about a global issue, I think it's clear that the environmental issue is, if it's not addressed on a global basis, it's not that's not to say we don't need to address it domestically as well, uh, but it also needs to be addressed globally or you're not going to be able to come to grips with it. And that requires enormous challenges to getting nations to cooperate, getting them to, uh, you face very difficult questions with developing countries who wish to go in a certain direction, uh, which is damaging to the environment, their own environment, and perhaps even more so to the worldwide environment, and when you try to somehow inhibit that, their immediate response is, well, you did it, why shouldn't we do it? It's, it's a difficult question to answer for the developed world, but it's one we have to come to grips with. The uh, question is, how difficult is it, in fact, to establish priorities in the economic area when you live in a federal system, and that relates to an earlier question of uh, whether we should duplicate the Japanese system. But the question is basically, uh, how do you do uh, systematic planning, setting priorities in a federal system? Well, of course, I think you do it on a partnership basis. Jim Rouse headed up a task force that the Senate uh, Banking and Housing Committee, has, Senate Housing Subcommittee, of which I'm a member, established to look into what could be done in the housing field. And he's come in with, I think, just an absolutely first-rate proposal but it involves a federal, state, local partnership with the private sector. And he's really laid out a framework, and I think it makes a lot of sense. If we can put it into place, there have to be some commitment of resources by the federal government, but it'll have to be matched by state and local governments. Then the, the programs will have to be done in conjunction with the private sector, so you're drawing in both the nonprofit and the profit private sector to address the housing issue. And uh, Jim has done it in a comprehensive way, so you're addressing not only the tragic problem of the homeless. I mean, it's incredible that in the world's uh, richest country, we're confronted with that kind of, of problem. 
But you know, he addresses a problem of uh, newlyweds getting housing, low income rental housing, um, middle income people, the whole housing market, which I think is how you have to do it. You have to have a, a total conceptual framework. On some of these other issues, the federal government's not the big spender. That's true in education, as you noted. But it often is an important catalyst. It provides important incentive money, important matching money. And I think it sets an example. By and large, I think if the federal government recedes from a commitment, the reaction at the state and local level is not usually to pick up on the commitment, but is also to recede as well. I mean, they sort of say, well, you know, if the federal government doesn't think it's very important, maybe it isn't very important, we'll recede from it as well. So I think you need that kind of commitment, and you obviously, I think, need it in education, and I think you need it in, uh, in infrastructure. Uh, there, again, we do much of that through matching money, so it's not done uh, simply on the basis of federal money, and it places some burden and responsibility on the state and, and local sector. I'm for solving these problems practically, pragmatically. I don't believe you can govern this country uh, off of an ideological uh, frame of reference. I think that's one of the difficulties we experienced over uh, most of the 1980s. You can't, I don't think that this country is too complex, too varied, too intricate. In fact, most countries are that way, to have some sort of preconceived notion, ideological notion into which you compress everything. I mean, I'm not for regulating any more than you have to. On the other hand, the deregulation mania swept through the savings and the financial industries uh, field, and now we're paying the price with respect to the savings and loans. We may be paying a price with respect to, to air deregulation because we didn't pick up on what we had to do to guard on the safety side. So, I mean, you have to take those problems in a very practical way. I think the questions are, would you comment on the Congress's big spenders, and um, does a lot of the fault um, of the charts that we see here lie in our congressional decision making? Well, there are lists of big spenders. I appear on some of them from time to time. <laughs> uh, a lot of them don't usually include this blue line of spending which is very interesting. I mean, a lot of the ones that lay out the big spenders include the orange line, but they don't include the blue line. And it seems to me, at a minimum, if you're going to make that judgment, you ought to include both lines. I don't know if that was the most appropriate last question of the evening. <laughs> but. But uh, it, it, we have exceeded our hour. Uh, Senator, we're grateful for what I think has been a very meaty session, uh, one of great interest and filled with good sense, and one that's given us a uh, marvelous view of the uh, senior senator from Maryland. Thank, Thank you. you all very much.